Hey, welcome back. We've been talking through ideas about work and energy in an AP Physics C mechanics class, as well as upper level physics classes. So let's continue the discussion and talk about what are conservative forces and non-conservative forces, and how do they relate to potential energy today. So I've got a problem here. Let's imagine we have a book, and this is the book's initial position. Here's the book's final position over here. And the problem that we're going to attempt to address right now is going to be to solve for the work due to gravity in terms of H. And so H isn't labeled here, but that's going to be our height difference between the two positions. These are the equations we've been working with lately. So we said that the definition of work more or less is force parallel times the displacement through which that force is applied. These two equations are not on your AP Physics C Mechanics equation sheet, but these two equations are. And I'll put a link up to another screencast I've done with more background about all of this, but let's go ahead and get to it. So first of all, we could say that the work that's done is equal to the force due to gravity dot distance through which that force is applied. So because these two vectors are at the same angle with each other, you could say essentially there is zero angle in between these two vectors. Effectively, they're in the same plane, and so as a result, we don't have to worry about the cosine of theta. So we could further simplify and apply this. This force due to gravity becomes mg over here times the distance through which that force is applied. And we can say, well, let's just sub in a delta h for that. And if we did that, we would say the work due to gravity is equal to mg delta h. Hopefully that looks familiar. Hopefully you can say, uh, that looks like potential energy. That is potential energy. And in fact, this is half of an equation that you're going to have on your equation sheet in the context of potential energy over here. I do want to point out that this delta H right here is going to be a negative delta H. If this is our initial position, this is our final position down here, the work that gravity does is going to have a negative change in the potential energy for the system. So please keep this in mind because we will come back to this. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's make the situation more complex. Let's say the book doesn't travel straight down, it travels at an angle over here, maybe it's sliding down a ramp. And so in that case, we're not looking at the work that friction does here. We're actually limiting ourselves to the work that gravity does in this case. And here, remember, this is the general equation you're given for a dot product. I'll put a link up to my dot product explanation. And so this is how we would apply it in this case. It would be the absolute value of the force due to gravity times the absolute value of d parallel is what I'm calling it right now, times cosine at the angle between them. Well, if we want to get this in terms of h, and I have added my delta h over here, then we can get an idea. We would say, well, we need to do something with this theta where we relate d parallel to our delta h. Let's go ahead and do that. So cosine of any angle, of course, is adjacent over hypotenuse. In this case, that would be delta h over d parallel. So what we're going to do is go ahead and take this, sub it in for a cosine of theta, and what we end up with is this. Now notice your d parallels can cancel each other out, and so we simplify, and we end up with the exact same answer that we had before. So is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. Of course not. So what we could say is, in this case, for gravity, it literally doesn't matter if the book goes straight down or if it goes off to the edge, like down a ramp or something like that. The work done by gravity is going to be the same in each case. What that means is the amount of work done is independent of the path taken. And that is really, really crucial for understanding the concept of a conservative force. So we're going to say, I just gave you two examples where the work done by gravity show that the path did not matter for the amount of work done. So that's really what we mean by a conservative force, or how we identify a conservative force, I should say. So conservative forces are forces where the work done by any two points is independent of the path taken by that object, and they also conserve mechanical energy. You could say mechanical energy is conserved with conservative forces, hence the name. It's also really crucial that I mention this because we're going to be building on these ideas where conservative forces, they have potential energies associated with them. And so at the end of this lesson, we're going to take this and run with it. I'll show you where we end up with this. So there are very important conservative forces. So for mechanics class, there really are two major ones. So there's the force due to gravity. And the spring force, those are both conservative forces that we need to pay close attention to. And then if you're doing electricity and magnetism, you would also need to include the electric force and the magnetic force as well. All right, so let's think about two other examples here. And these I'm going to do more of a conceptual example. So let's say you had a book 
on a table and you were going to apply a force and it slid across the table. And the question is, is the amount of work done by friction independent of the path like conservative forces are? So if you think about it, you've got a certain amount of friction that would be created if you just push a book across a desk. Obviously, there's more to that we could say, like what's the angle at which you're pushing across the desk? What's the coefficient of kinetic friction and so on? Yes, there's more to it than that. But let's go ahead and see what else we could say. Well, what if in a second scenario, we took that book and we didn't just go straight across, but instead we went over many times back and forth as we went from our initial position to our final position. Would that matter with the amount of friction that would be created? What do you think? And the answer is yeah, actually the path would matter. If we went back and forth a thousand times or a million times, there would be more friction that would be created in the process than if we just went over one time from our initial position to our final position, right? So in this case, the pathway does matter. And so to answer a question, is the amount of work done by friction done independent of the path like conservative forces are? The answer is no, it's not independent of the path. In fact, friction depends on the path traveled. So friction is a non-conservative force. This is really crucial. One other way to think about this is that the energy from the system is lost in the environment. If you think about friction, friction produces heat, which is thermal energy, just random motion molecules. You could say the surface of the book and the surface of the table, their temperatures raise very slightly because some of that energy has gone into the surrounding environments. And that's not energy you're going to get back into like say kinetic energy. All right, and so to summarize, we're gonna say the two examples you just saw the work done by friction show that the path does matter for the amount of work done. So that is an example of non-conservative forces where the work done by any two points is dependent on the path taken. Non-conservative forces do not conserve mechanical energy. So we'll talk more about that later. For our purposes, we need to talk about two very important non-conservative forces friction and the drag force. You could say that the drag force is just basically a form of friction anyway. So you could think of it as the amount of energy that the system has is losing energy to the environment as it moves and there is friction that is just a loss of energy from the system to the environment. And it's non-conservative in one sense because it's not energy that you can easily recover. All right, so to summarize, we can say conservative forces. Two examples would be gravity and the spring force and then non-conservative examples would be friction and the drag force. Next up, we could say they have the same amount of work done independent of the path taken. All you need to know is where is the initial point and where is the final point, and you can do some calculations with the amount of work done with conservative forces. Whereas for non-conservative forces, they have different amounts of work done depending on the path taken. And we came up with this for those two examples, those two first examples I gave you. Here, what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna talk about the work done by a conservative force is equal to a negative change in potential energy for that object. So think about it this way. The work done by gravity is exactly equal to the loss of energy from the book as it went from its initial position to its final position. So that mg delta h, that delta h was a negative value, right? And so that work done by gravity is associated with a negative change in potential energy. So this whole lesson is a buildup to this statement right here. So I can make this statement and build on this and you will understand what I'm talking about when I use this in our next lesson. So I'll put a link to that up when I get a chance as well. If you have any comments or questions, let me know down below. Oh, check the description if you like for more playlists. I've done screencasts on basically an entire year of physics as well as many concepts for AP Physics C. Take care.